Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, edition of PBM session. Today, we'll be talking about the Unit 10 under the Block 3, which talks about brand equity. Today's session, we will be covering the concept of brand equity and its contribution to competitive advantage. We'll also be looking into what constitutes or what are the components that goes into explaining the term brand equity. Uh, we'll also assess various uh, models which are used to measure uh, to assess the uh, brand equity. Uh, there are a few uh, customer based as well as the financial based uh, brand equity models. We will talk about customer based brand equity model and how do you build a brand equity and help developing strong brands in the portfolio. So let's get started. So when we talk about branding, since so today's market uh, marketers cannot live without branding. Branding is a necessity. It, we are developing brands in order to create more competitive advantage in the marketplace. But when you look into the worth of the brand and the kind of investment that goes into it, there is a sustained effort on the parts of the marketers or the organizations to create a positive uh, vibe towards the uh, the brands that they own from the customers, from the stakeholders alike. So if you look into, if you remember last class, I talked about how brands are defined. Mostly that's a very rudimentary way of looking at how brands are. But obviously if you see it definitely talks about a name or a term or a logo, a symbol, a design, or it could be a, a some kind of a description it could also be a combination of these or it could be identifiable individual elements which are used to identify. Now that is very critical to identify the product or service which is being offered for the, uh, cons con the consumers by the company. So obviously it has a very clear cut objective of differentiating, identifying the offering from the company. So the more the brands, the more the kind of requirement for you to enhance to, to, to see that the brands are performing well. Now, whenever these brands are offered to the consumers, of course, what can need, what kind of a perception or what kind of an impact does it hold or how the consumers look at it uh, from various aspects. So obviously some of the aspects which have been listed out here, I'll get take you through. Some of the things which they are mostly customers look for when they look at brands is that obviously they look into the product attributes. Uh, any product attribute that we talk about, when let's say when you talk about a company offering certain products, they are they have certain core competency. For example, Tata Steel talk about steel, so they talk about we make steel for India. So obviously that is a kind of reputation. We talk about Volvo. Volvo stands for safety. So so every company or Toyota talks about perfection. Uh, so every company has gotten certain attributes which they do it here we are talking in terms of the company but it could be also product related attributes for example you could talk about the uh, horlicks which has got a particular component to increase the uh, stamina or to increase the iq level and so on and so forth so and the next is the benefits now benefits are something which the customers always look forward to in terms of uh, connecting with the products which are offered so generally, uh, customers look for functional benefits or certain emotional benefits. We have already talked about how in case of uh, iPhone, it also leads, leads to the emotional needs apart from giving the functional needs. But when you are pitching it, when, when a company is pitching it, obviously they look into these dynamics in terms of what is the benefit that the customer is looking forward to and then factor it in. In cases like consumer products like your Dettol, we took into the you know, uh, the antiseptic properties are a very functional uh, thing so that it, it helps you to uh, ward off the infection. But at the same time, it also talks about protection. So protection is an emotional feel that it, you feel protected when you say, okay, I have cleaned something with Dettol. The general perception in the minds of people is that it is uh, it's, it's beneficial. So they look at the benefit in terms of the emotional connect with the brand, with the product. So next we move into the values. I think values are very important for any uh, organization, uh, for, for any company, when they are talking about their brands. What does a brand stand for? Does it stand for quality? Does it stand for uh, 
ethical standards that they talk about when you talk about an organic brand like body shop and it says that it does not involve any of the uh, you know, uh, cruelty to the animals in terms of their uh, while they're testing the products uh, you talk about mama earth a brand like that talks about the environmental uh, uh, system so they talk about the company stands for certain ethical standards and they bring that value into uh, the uh, communication with the brands and of course they stand for certain ethical parameters going forward you can also find that the culture most of the you know many brands have come out from different country of origin and when we factor that as a part of your organization uh, in the in the brands in terms of uh, representing that culture uh, most of the japanese brands too we must have seen not only our scooters like uh, suzuki we have seen samurai they try to talk about the uh, the japanese culture or talk about volkswagen which talks about the german culture right so this gets basically orients you towards in terms of these people associate like german technology is associated to be more uh, authentic in terms of uh, their uh, technical prowess so it has a different kind of a viewpoint compared to others uh, personalities of course every brand needs to personate or has builds a kind of a, a personal parameters which differentiates which helps in differentiating it from the others you have heard of l18 for example l18 is a basically a teenage product cosmetics range of products which it represented when it was launched you talk about lux lux talks about beauty dove also talks about beauty but it talks about the moisturizing content in it uh, if you talk about uh, marlboro which is the example given here we talk about it was earlier if you see it had a very very strong us connect a us feel levi's this has got a very very american feel to it so you talk about machoism and things like that Nike, in case of footwear, talks about if you see that shush which is there, just to it talks about the killer instinct, the going and making it happen, which is associated with uh, a, a sports person, but the point is it can also be related to any person. So you will find that all these things are uh, basically captured, these properties are captured in a person, and you try to relate it to the product so that the brand has a better acceptance in terms of the, uh, the consumer connect. Talking in terms of user, who is going to use this product? For example, many products, you know, have, have got in the mindset that when you say first cry, we talk about, okay, it's meant for infants. Uh, we, how does that get further enforced? By the kind of logos, the symbols, the terms, and the slogans that are associated, which is basically talks about who's going to be the user. We talk about Dove, it talks about purity, it talks about the, the kind of, you know, the beauty through the moisturizing content, but it's talking about the purity as well. So the white color depicts certain kind of a thing. If we talk about the uh, hero uh, pleasure, for example, when we talked about why it typically pitched it for the, the, the girls segments in the why should boys have all the fun that was a slogan which went and they said okay then it got typified that okay if you're looking into a pleasure it would be a scooty kind of a thing this means mostly meant for a kind of a women so you get typified by that like jeep is used by you know the police people or you talk about the omni uh, the marathi omni used by uh, nursing homes uh, or you know the suv is used by the traveling so it gets typified in that fa fashion like in this case we are talking about bullet is used by a police uh, now understand a good brand would always connote different meanings to that and as a marketer it is our responsibility to how to utilize these different meanings to the advantage so that the consumer is able to connect better able to appreciate the differentiation is able to recognize it better and adopt it better and that defines the essence of the brand now let's look into the, uh, the, so this is what the brand does. Like, so every brand has got some kind of a work. So when you talk about the work, that needs to be represented in form of what we call as a brand equity. Uh, so far till the early 80s, there was no particular definition per se as to what brand equity meant. But there are two things which we, we always talk about is the long term customer connect that it has or the resonance it has with the customer. And the second one is talking in terms of the uh, financial value that the brand carries. 
suppose if I am a brand co, obviously there is certain financial value attached to me in terms of a brand valuation that shows my strength in the, in the competitive market. And if you're talking in terms of the consumer connect, we're talking about how why customers like to associate with a brand like co. And uh, these are the things which we'll talk in terms when we, we talk, we talk about it very uh, emphatically in our communication strategies, in our advertisements, in our brand promotions and brand communication to reinforce uh, the sales so that there is increased sales which comes on. It's not only that we are talking about only sales, but we are looking into a very, very positive uh, uh, kind of a affinity or familiarity, favorability from the customer so they get they stick with the brand for a longer period of time and start believing in it in a big way and this particular aspect calls for why people give uh, more weightage to even the if you're talking about a price they would not look at price they would look into the brand so in one few examples which are shared here if you see here we talk about 72 percent of the consumers pay a 20 percent premium for their favorite brand now, this premium which you talk about is nothing but the uh, equity. It's a, it's a kind of equity which needs to be explained in various factors. What goes into that? There are multiple factors which uh, talks about why a consumer is willing to pay that premium of 20% more. Why would anybody do that? Primarily because they believe that that premium stems from a very, very strong product attribute, the benefit that we have just not referred to or the value that they are looking forward to. You will find that this the brand equity is also expressed in terms of financial terms. When you're assessing the equity, the value of the brands gets reflected as uh, in terms of the financial value. That is why brands have also been equated as financial assets to any organization. Today, it cannot be ignored. So if you have a very robust kind of a brand portfolio and the brand has a value which you can leverage upon, it really pays back to the organization in a big way. So the top-notch people or the people who are at the top uh, also cannot ignore the importance of having very strong financial, uh, financially viable brands, which can be considered as assets. When you look into the portfolio, it also talks about the market dominance in the place. This has been reflected in the various kind of, uh, uh, you know, if you see here, the kind of listing of uh, valuable brands by Statistica, or global valuable brands. You, I guess we talked about the uh, brand valuation, which is done by uh, Interbrand uh, to, to, to come up with the overall brand standing across the globe. So you will find that some of the brands are in the top notch. They, and they, when you look into why it is top notch, it can be equated in terms of a financial value. So that is the financial uh, might of that brand which has an equity in the marketplace and because of that particular brand value being stronger they're able to it of course talks about the strength of the brand in the marketplace competing in comparison to the competitor and of course it talks in terms of the dominance it has in the marketplace right so we will look into uh, what are the various attitude towards uh, consumer attitude towards a brand because that's again a very important part of when we talk about the financial part we, we, are, we should also be talking about the customer franchise because i talked about how customers engage with the customer they look at the brand is also very very important and if you find that one of the key factors that marketers always talk about is the loyalty of the brand of the consumers towards a particular brand that means how much of a favorableness do they have in terms of a brand so that they would adopt it sustain it for a longer period of time and spread up perhaps a good word of mouth to others and help the brand establish in the marketplace so if you see there are different levels of attitude that uh, consumers may have towards a brand one would be the of course on one end of the uh, this uh, scale there would be no brand loyalty so these people are the ones who would be you know due to price differential customers may uh, get into a kind of a switching activity which leads to a brand switching activity. They will not consider anything beyond, okay, a brand is brand or not. They will not be able to differentiate also the differential aspects that the brands are bringing in. Um, the second one is they don't switch, but they're satisfied. So if you see on one hand, you have got people who have absolutely no, no uh, loyalty, they would go for a switch. The others one may not switch, but they will be satisfied, more or less satisfied, but not very clear about it. 
The third category would be the one which will they're satisfied and would go that extra mile, which we talked about in that particular expression, saying that putting that 20% extra, even at a cost, higher cost, I'm willing to pay that premium to uh, switch the brand, which means what? On, until and unless you're being internally moved, you will not move, or you will not take that decision. This is a very critical uh, attitude which one can look into. So whenever you're talking about the switching cost, generally for any customer to switch from one brand to another brand, there is a cost that you, these costs are can be the psychic cost, there could be psychological cost, there could be uh, of course risk cost, there could be financial, I mean in terms of quantitative terms if there's a cost, but psychic cost is something which we are referring to here in terms of which which affects their, uh, the mentality or the psychographic profiling of psychographic considerations of a person. And customers, the, the way they relate to the brand, how do they see that, uh, we talked about brand personality, how much do I see myself in that brand? Today, if I associate myself with uh, a particular brand like Mercedes, somewhere down the line, my personal characteristics and the brand personality characteristics match to a certain extent and that's why that relationship has been mentioned and hence I feel yes, it is something which was worth considering. And the last but not the least is the highest level of conviction that I have in terms of the confidence of the brand where we're talking about very hard work Acker, on the basis of these last three parameters of attitudes, which I just talked about, has been able to identify or been able to define uh, the brand equity as a set of assets. They can be assets, they can be liabilities. So if your attitudes are favorable, so they'll be assets. And if they are not there, it will be a liability. If it's an asset, it will add to the value. and you know, if it is a liability, it will just subtract the value that you give by providing a product or service to a firm and to the customers. And these are generally linked to what your brand is representing. So when you when you offer that brand, you obviously have an identity to which you to go for. So you have a set of assets which are linked to that brand. So when I, if you remember, when Reliance got demerged into two entities, the Reliance Industries logo was given to Mukesh Ambani Group. The ADAG, on the other hand, Anil uh, Ambani had to work out a completely different strategy. They came up with a name called ADAG. The company spent crores to only to tell people that they are so. That is the kind of importance that the, the name has, right? Just to put things into perspective. Now, what are the components that goes into a brand equity? We will next look at that. So I would take help of this particular framework, as you can see it on the screen here. As you can see here, this is the block diagram that we talk about four or five different parameters which are critically uh, looked upon in terms of enhancing brand equity. We'll go, go to them one by one and then we go to the, the, the middle one is basically talking in terms of the outputs and the last column talks in terms of what is the value that accrue from that into the customers, to the, to the, the, to the channel members and to the various people who are associated with the, including the firm for uh, getting better, better uh, leverage of having an equity. So when a brand has an equity, obviously it will basically uh, have a positive impact. So if you see where are the sources from where you can, uh, which can form brand equity according to this particular framework by David Acker. David Acker. Uh, so he has identified the first thing that you need to have is the uh, brand awareness. Right, when you talk about brand awareness, it refers to the strength of the brand in the consumer's mind. How, how aware I am of that particular brand, it, terms, it comes from the fact that whether I recognize it, whether I identify it, whether I am able to, um, when I'm purchasing, does it click? Does it achieve something called top of the mind recall? Um, when I'm going to buy a particular, say I'm going to buy a television, is one particular brand playing strong in my mind or there are several other brands. Now the degree to which these brands get activated in my memory space would primarily depend upon the kind of awareness that I've been, uh, that has happened with me over a period of time. It is not just one thing. We are seeing the ads day in day now, but then what is the kind of uh, familiarity or the recognition or the recall factor that the brand has? And that's what we are talking in terms of the awareness. You will find this is the building block. This is the most major part of any, any organization to build brand equity. They must have something called the 
brand awareness. So looking into recognition factors, what when you try to recognize, uh, it comes from that, okay, uh, it comes from the, you have, you have been exposed to it, may not have used it, but they have seen it somewhere. So when you, uh, when you go and buy, you are able to, when you are walking down the street and you find there is a kiosk or there is a hoarding, it tries, okay, you are noticing it. You may not remember, you may not use the product, okay, it may not lead to uh, any kind of a comparison, but it is just there as a kind of a, uh, a, a noticeable factor. Now, when you when you enter, when you go and purchase, you may find, okay, I found out about this, so what, that, that's, I have heard about this particular company or I have heard of this particular brand. Right. Some of the brands get recognized uh, because they represent the product and yesterday I was talking uh, represent a particular product category like in case of Xerox which has been mentioned here. The last class also I talked to you about that how Xerox became a Xerox in case of photocopiers, Dalda in case of vegetable oils, right? Kodak in terms of uh, camera. They started becoming the what is called a generic brand. They became almost synonymous with the product category and that helped whenever you when you say it's almost started being used as a verb. Today we talk about Google, we say you Google it. So Google has become so critical in terms of information gathering as a, as a, as a platform. We say you Google it. So Google is used as when the brand becomes a verb, it becomes more generic, right? <clears throat> the next most important part which needs according to David Acker is the perceived quality. It is a judgment that, uh, you know, uh, that the consumer has towards the quality of the product. Of course, you know that quality is one of the major parameters that any company would like to offer in their products. And what is the objective? The objective is to pack in high quality so that it has a higher uh, quality perception in the minds of the people. And of course, the customers can differentiate it better from the competitors and get aligned to buying that particular product. Now, it may so happen that, you know, these uh, over these can go through a transient times. This perceived quality is not something which is uh, built in one transaction. It takes its own time and it is also supported by various other parameters like the cultural, the social, the reference groups with which uh, the customer is engaged in. So how you are communicating about their qualities, what is the quality that you are part, uh, about their, uh, you know, how you have been offering them in the past, how they've been performing, all this come as a part of a perceived quality. If your promises that you have made in your advertisements and that gets resumed, that gets actually get implemented when the consumer are using it, the consumer experience has been good, they are matching the requirements which you have talked about. In that case, obviously, the obviously it, it works, it gets more reinforced, the perception is very good. Otherwise, it can also spell disaster. If you see in the technical products also, you'll find that in some cases, uh, we find that the products earlier were not acceptable. For example, Chinese products, if you say, uh, we, we take it with a pinch of salt. Of course, there are quality products from China, but then there are many things to say that oh, the current, uh, Chinese products do not do lack quality. Now that can play that that particular perceived perception that is there might play in the minds of the people, even if there's a good product in the marketplace. So one has to be very careful about how this perception is built. Like in case of Japanese product, they were early considering after World War One, they didn't have any resources. So most of the products were considered to be cheap and poor. But as of now, when you talk about superior quality, the innovation, when it talks about innovation, it's Japan. So all the Japanese companies which you talk about, they've heavily talked in terms of the kind of quality that drives these those brands in the marketplace. And if you look at it, there are further considerations that you must also understand that the weather the dimension that you're talking about quality, does that make sense? If people always get cues in terms of when they associate with quality, when they say, okay, this is coming from uh, certain parameters, which you, which you you know, like for example, to see the fabric of a cloth, one would stretch and see the, the kind of uh, tensile strength it has. Like in case of the car tires, the example that is given here, you some people tick the car to see that, okay, how much, how sturdy it is. Of course, these are visible cues that you are associating to uh, influence the perception of the uh, quality. Other things could be that you are using um, various kind of claims. Uh, you're talking in terms of visual elements to, as a metaphor, to tell them that, okay, this is what perceived uh, quality is all about. 
The next most important thing is uh, in terms of brand equity, according to David Acker, is the brand loyalty. Now, the loyalty comes from simply think how much the person is talking in terms of placing a value onto the brand and how much is buying it for, what kind of price, uh, you know, uh, sensitivity of at all it is there, how that is getting loyalty. If you find that brand loyalty is a factor which is there with you, obviously the customer might be associated with you for a longer period of time that helps you to overcome the cost the cost acquisition cost which is there once it is established the so obviously loyalty is a kinds of acts as a um, a very strong uh, leveraging point for the company from the competitors also it builds a certain kind of a barrier and when a person is loyal to a particular brand obviously that works in their advantage for the company and also helps to maintain the patronage but then point is loyalty can also be segmented into one part where you know uh, people they can be segmented in different groups like for example there could be people who could not would be non-customers they may not who buy only the who buy other brands okay. no not at all loyal or there could be people who only switch for the price constraints there are people who uh, who find that happen, uh, they, they would look into passive loyalty. They would look for something and then, you know, they're a little bit exposed. They might use it and look to availability. If it is not available, they may go for a brand switching. But there are people who are in the fence sitters, which are called fence sitters. They would differentiate between one or two brands maximum. But there are people who will be committed. Now, obviously, from an organization point of view, if I'm looking at a market segment in terms of loyalty, I would look into a committed. But then that's not the reality. The reality is that we will have a, a range of loyalties as we are looking into the markets. But point is, as a marketer, am I able to identify these brand switchers? Where are the gaps that are there? And how we are plugging those? And how do we take care of these people who are passive loyal? If you're not taking care of them, then perhaps we are going to find that there will be some inroads made by competitors, like in the case given here is of Tantkanti, to carve out a, a chunk of the market share by advocating some kind of a herbal thing. It was not that herbal products were there earlier, but they managed to uh, create a dent into the bastion of Colgate. Uh, so we find many such things, like in case of uh, uh, Nirma, they wanted to create a dent into the market of detergents in, in case of that. So one has to be very careful about if there are passive loyals, you have to take care of them as well. You cannot ignore them, right? Uh, so you have to be with the customers so that the, the loyalty factor is maintained because customers always like to be, um, uh, be appreciated, to be taken care of, they will be, they, they, to be asked. Right. So a lot of times you maintain to need to maintain a kind of a today you see you, uh, you create blogs, you create interactivity so that the customer tries to explain what they are looking forward to and you engage with the customer more and more. And that, you know, makes that helps to shift the loyalty towards a more committed part. Right. Having said that, there could be there will be some slippage, but we need to know that if you have loyal customers, your probably your products will be better accepted. You can have a better, you can also try getting into the premium segment or try to get better mileage out of it because there will be some cost savings due to this. Brand association, this is the next most important part is this, what is the, uh, the equity talks about in terms of the association. For example, what is the kind of imagery, image that is associated with the, the brand? Uh, so we use in in, in brands we, in advertising and all that we use a lot of attributes symbols music celebrities to create those imageries in the minds of the people if you remember the classic uh, uh, airtel ad it talks about that music which basically talks about airtel of course it was composed by ar Rahman. Uh, even the britannia still still has those uh, music elements which explore to propagate what the brand stands for uh, or you could be talking about brand endorsers, brand endorsers which have been very, very in sync with uh, the products. Here, the case of Sachin Tendulkar for Boost. Now, when Sachin Tendulkar is used for Boost, but understand these people are also used for other products. So, are they fitting into that requirement? So, when you talk about the acceptance of uh, uh, a brand endorser we, or a celebrity usage, you've got to see whether it is uh, acceptable to the people or not. 
in case of lux if you see it's a beauty soap which is used celebrities anybody who is to endorse the brand lux was considered to be the number one so much so that they've continued consistently talking about it until today it's a brand which is worth its so whatever it may not be a very great product but ultimately it translates into a kind of an accept an association which is very difficult to break and they've been able to harp it from time and again and they've been consistently being able to reinforce that again and again uh, if you talk about Lyrel as a brand, it talks about freshness. They talk, we brought in the lemon component into the, that, the very, uh, very classic uh, ad campaign, which brought out uh, the elements. Very uh, at that point of time, it was launched was considered to be a uh, kind of a uh, game changer for the brand. So you can use brand associations to talk about it. The next we move into is the proprietary brand assets. Proprietary assets are one which basically contributes towards the protection of the brand because you are spending so much of in, in money into uh, the brands. One has to understand that it needs to be legally protected because to also as to uh, ward off the competitors from copying, the, uh, copying it. So this is these are the things which basically accrue towards the outcome in terms of better acceptance, better um, value for the customer, and also to the consumer. And as well as if you have a good um, Product, brands which have a better equity in the marketplace, you will find that companies can leverage, uh, they can leverage out the financial leverage is their market dominance is there, their board of competition, the trade channel members, they can flex their muscles. So these are some of the things which you get as a competitive advantage while looking into the brand equity. So on various fronts, you find that pursuing brands and equity and having an equity always works towards an advantages. Now, when we're talking about brands in terms of current things, we are not only talking about creating brands, but also nurturing brands and looking at brands and tenants from the long term perspective. Because today, when brands are being, uh, you know, uh, the value of the brand talks in terms of how the brand is also relating it to in terms of the uh, as an asset, which I told you that financially, if I were to have strong brands in my portfolio, how it is going to be leveraged upon in terms of marketability of the uh, products. Today, we use a term called brand extensions, where you can use the same brand across multiple extended product categories, which helps us to leverage better because the cost comes down. Like for example, in case of Maggi, Maggi was in noodles and we got into pasta, we got into soups, we got into uh, ketchups, we got into pickles. Okay, some of them are related. So obviously you'll find that the, the extension, the possibility of an extension happened primarily because the brand equity of Maggi in case of noodle could be leveraged and you could come up with a uh, product development plan uh, by entering new markets or new customers. <coughs> Next we move into how do we measure the brand equity. So there are different models which are there, the quantitative and qualitative models, but Young and Rubicam is one such, uh, is an agency which has developed the brand equity across parameters like uh, differentiation, relevance, esteem, and knowledge. We talks about brand personality and brand stature. Uh, we talk in terms of differentiation, how differentiated is the brand, how distinct is the brand from that of the competitor in a given product category. Second, we look into the relevance of the brand to the, uh, we look into the, from the when, when you collect that information from a respondent, we see how critical it is there for the customer to be fun to find it relevant. So it talks about the uh, the stature of the brand. When you talk about the knowledge of the brand, we're talking to know what it stands for. What is the company trying to talk about? See, it's a kind of brand promise uh, from that the brand is associated when the company is talking about it. And when you talk in terms of the perception of the quality, which we're just talking about it, we're talking about the esteem factors. What kind of values can be associated with that? So all this can be culled out from your a survey and you can sequentially put it in terms of how brands can be built and your equity can be leveraged upon. Equity trend is another uh, measure uh, where you tend we can develop brand equity on three brand assets. One is called the brand salience, product perceived quality and user satisfaction. Most of these terms can be are, are often interchangeably used but the point is that the focus is on the what it stands for. When you talk about brand salience, it talks about how much is your brand is thought of when you are making the purchase and how much it has been noticed, right? Uh, it goes beyond things like uh, recognition, awareness and recall factors. Because at the point of purchase, when you are making a decision, does the brand salience work? 
that's a moment of truth for you. So whenever you are able to get that notification, okay, fine, this is the brand which I should go for, it may work as a, a, a positive thing. But then point is how much communication has been given to that particular consumer in terms of to, to make such kind of a judgment, right? Of course, uh, awareness, recognition do play a part in that. I'm not denying that. But at the same time, it also talks about for us, for the brand to be noticeable from the past experience or from the kind of uh, engagement that the consumer has, we find that savings plays an important role. Per se, per day, I need not talk about it. We have here that they talk about something like an 11 point scale, which ranges from outstanding to unacceptable. So obviously, uh, the percent quality for outstanding is very good if it is there and if it is not acceptable, obviously on the lower side. The user satisfaction is another important where you can qualitatively rate customers' uh, perception in terms of how what their satisfaction scores are. Now, I would get into another um, David Acker's framework, which talks about a composite brand equity measure to measure the brand equity. Others, the other one was the model which talks about what are the sources of assets and liabilities, those five parameters. These are the basically the composite equity measures. So there are a few criteria. So the measure should reflect equity. That means what? It talks in terms of the degree of importance that the brand is having and can it be considered as an asset and which cannot be easily duplicated by the competitors. And it should reflect what markets you are being, you are uh, basically available to. What is the potential that you can get an ROI with this particular brand? And of course, how sensitive, if there's a change in any of the parameters, how does it affect? And uh, going across, can there be a situation where you can extend it to product categories and other markets over a period of time? We, we talked about brand extension. So these are captured in these 10 equi brand equity 10 uh, attribute uh, uh, categories, as we can call them, or it's called a brand equity 10 measures which is built on these four criteria which we have just now talked about. So pre price premium, it talks about loyalty measures. If you see what kind of, uh, see when you say prime price premium, why would anybody be interested in getting a price premium? Obviously it talks about the kind of loyalty it, it, it represents. So it is a significant indicator of the, the loyalty that the brand has. Now going forward, <clears throat> So, so when you have asked a question like uh, you must have seen that um, in case of the classic example of uh, Nestle uh, compared to brew, why would you pay a higher thing for a brew? So the, the, the price premium comes with a difference. Like for when we used to go for a Sony television, uh, remember? So why would you pay that extra premium for the Sony brand? Even today, it talks about certain technology which you use. So if that technology is work for me, there could be, I, I feel very happy about it in terms of its usage. I will basically look into the loyalty factors which plays. But after saying that, you must also be, there are certain uh, inadequacies which can be used, which can be thought of in terms of price premium. For example, if you are trying to change the value of the price premium, it can you can make so for example if you're changing the what the prime uh, premium price premium is all about or you're trying to dilute it it can uh, have a problem so that is something which you need to do and when your product is different is competing with different uh, competitors in different market segments then the price premium does may work may not work so you've got to be very clear about that uh, customer satisfaction this is customer satisfaction is another very important parameter how satisfied you are i've already talked about the satisfaction uh, scale that is again important factor you just cannot say just unsatisfied what are you satisfied about those parameters have to be uh, understood perceived quality because when you talk about perceived quality it talks about how the uh, quality reflects is reflected across various parameters so you you can ask questions from the people in from the respondents to uh, associate with perceived quality we've already talked about perceived quality in quite detail so that can be used as a kind of a set of variables to be assessed to assess the person the perceived quality going to the popularity and leadership positions when you talk about that, what proportion of the market is buying in terms of market dominance what is the market share that this brand has in terms of other competitors how does it uh, you know 
has a superiority over others. So those are the factors which can be looked into in terms of the uh, popularity. Perceived value, we are talking about differentiating measures and association. When you say perceived value, what is the value that a consumer perceives about the value of the brand? And it can be, uh, you know, if you see in terms of product, it may be the same, but the point is when you are putting it across to a person, the way he uses it, the way he perceives the difference, and with engagements, with better usage of the product, the perceived value can be different. So obviously, the companies should look at marketers, look into enhancing the customer engagement and so that the value is not only created properly, communicated properly, and also delivered properly, because all these are critical for creating the differentiation. Brand personality, as I've told you, that what is the personality attributes? If the brand was a human, uh, like what kind of attributes should it have? When you talk about Barbie, what, what kind of attributes comes out? If you talk about um, Alan Solly, what does the brand talk about? So you would find that we're able to personalize the brand and this personalization is very critical for establishing the association. Organizational association, the company, which is, when you say it's a Tata product, it's a Volvo, it's a, a Sony, it's a, you know, it comes from Microsoft or whatever. A lot of our Samsung, LG, it all builds in the kind of credibilities or the, uh, the kind of positioning that these brands have at an organization level being able to associate with the people and that translates into the acceptance brand awareness i've already talked about and what kind of awareness that you need to have obviously awareness means you would definitely look into both the salience the recognition the recall the kind of um, the, you know brand salience aspects which becomes very critical uh, but this is the building block until you have awareness this of me we talk about it in some time in some time right now then talk about market share market share talks about the way the market behaves the, the way you, you know the consumer base is uh, a dominant market share would always talk in terms of what kind of you know uh, presence you have in the marketplace but it, when, you, when you talk about uh, certain problems like with the product class what kind of market does it serve market share may not be with classic indicator of that, but we need to further deep dive into understanding the uh, market share parameters. So which market, what behavior, what kind of uh, comparison we have to have uh, when we use for evaluating our brand portfolios. We'll talk about that when we use something like a BCG matrix or so. Uh, the tenth is the, obviously the last is the market price and price distribution. Obviously, if you look into the relative price that the brand has in comparison to others, uh, can be another criteria for establishing the brand equity. Similarly to distribution you, uh, coverage, what is the kind of stocks that are available of my brand in that particular store and what is the kind of customer take uh, offtake that is happening? That can be also be a kind of a measure of uh, brand equity. Going further, we will look into the composite measure of a brand equity. You see something like this, a brand equity power index. Here, what we have done is that we have taken parameters like awareness, uh, brand loyalty, price value and association, and we have taken a weightage because understand when you talk in terms of the constructs, these are all the constructs on which the brand equity is being prepared. So brand equity is influenced by awareness, loyalty, price and association, and uh, they have certain weightages so these are the weightages which have been around. So if you are looking into brand equity, the brand loyalty factor, as you can see from the importance here, is given more priority to assess the brand equity power index of a, uh, of a particular brand compared to awareness of price value or in terms of association that the brand uh, tries to attribute to the uh, consumers. Next, we move into what is called as the most important part of how the customer based brand equity is uh, explained. This is for this, we uh, always refer to another important work done by Kevin Lynn Kaler, who came up with the CBB model, or which is called the customer based brand equity model. Uh, the basic, the moot point in this particular model, it's, it, it, the premise is that the customer plays a critical role in the creation and management of the uh, brand equity. So it is, if you see, I'll take you through the, uh, the, the, the framework under which it is uh, built out. It talks about what kind of a knowledge is existing in the minds of the customer 
that helps the customer to be in uh, to use the brand to take it forward to leverage upon and the kind of integration that you've been able to uh, uh, achieve by the customer involvement process this happens primarily because of the brand knowledge so the brand knowledge here is plays a very very critical role and when we talk about brand knowledge when we uh, consider brand knowledge what do we mean by that there are two factors which we talk about one is called the brand awareness which is linked to brand recall and brand recognition and the other one is the brand image brand image as we talked about in the last class we we talked about what is the set of values beliefs or uh, we associate with the brand in the minds of the the way it is perceived by the consumers right so this contributes both these contribute towards the brand knowledge we already talked about brand recall factor whether my brand is being recalled whenever there is a need for me need for a product is my brand recalled suppose i want to go for a soap is my brand there in the in the top of the mind to call or is it one single brand it's one single dominant brand do i recognize a new brand that has been introduced in the marketplace it depends upon you will find that what kind of measures are taken by the company to ensure that the customer is able to recognize as well as recall the brands because recall recognition is one thing then it further it has to be used right the recall factor comes in terms of a repeat maybe a repeat purchase right by doing that what happens you associate also while you are doing this the brand knowledge talks in terms of set of association it's a network of various nodes of uh, association which it's a which contributes towards the favorableness or unfavorableness towards a particular brand so when you talk about the brand knowledge it talks about as a, a network of the uh, one is the brand awareness the other one is the network of associations that is that is built up so what kind of brand association you can see the attribute based attribute are mostly product related uh, attributes or they can be non product related attributes as you can see these could be the non related attributes like the price the packaging the user imagery user imagery talks about who is the user of that uh, product right usage is the in what application it is being used milk made if you see it was basically you talk about usage it was used oh, the the user category it was meant for the uh, the milk they wanted to substitute the milk but unfortunately it became a sweetener a sweet maker uh, so today when you unwrap and take up the packaging of uh, milk made you find the recipe has been put because you're talking about the user category imagery which is associated has very significantly changed we'll talk about repositioning exercises the brand repositioning which is also very critical for brand association while we talk about these in promotion we also talk about the benefits they can be functional experiential or symbolic not all brands give functional benefits but they also experience you experience like in amusement park you, you experience that thing starbucks talks about a complete experience to talk about it is not a cafe or it's not a coffee that matters it's the experience that matters so you associate with that particular aspect symbolic obviously when you go to mcdonalds you talk about the uh, kind of environment all these parameters which are built into creating the benefits uh, even in case of when you hold a, a iphone that's a symbolic it's symbolic of your lifestyle attitudes again are very very critical in terms of assessing the uh, brand associations now if you look into the kind of uh, brand associations that people have they have to be favorable now the favorability of the brand comes from how the brand is being uh, you know in terms of informing the people if if it is creating a positive vibe what kind of information are you packing it when you are creating your advertising campaigns so the more you are able to put your customers into a thinking mode or in terms of information search in the consumer decision making process you will find that the more the clarity comes in the more the favorability is likely to achieve second we look into the uh, the strength because once we give the information and we push them towards the purchase obviously people when they use it they see the uh, strength of the brand association whether what the brand promises are there whether are they being really accept making it happen or not making it happen or uh, consumers are not getting it or are getting much more than it are they getting 
um, what you call as customer delight in that particular engagement that you are talking about. So you need to understand the strength of brand association creates a really strong image and a strong level of favorableness towards the brand. So the more you have brand, strong brand association, it will be critical to the success of the uh, brand image, which again feeds into the brand knowledge. And the other one we talk about is the uniqueness of your, uh, how unique are you to gain a competitive advantage? You are in the same space. Uh, so others are also talking about it. They also pitch in with the kind of, uh, you know, uh, brand associations. If your brand association is unique, right, then obviously you are creating a unique image in the minds of the people, which people will not, uh, if it's a me too kind of a thing, Yes, there is a chance of a dilution happening. So you consistently keep on looking into how to keep that particular brand association unique, strong and favorable. So these are the things which are there in case of a uh, Keller's model of CBBE, right? Now coming into how brands are created, obviously we look into three considerations for building once, as you can see it here, the choice of brand elements. So when you are creating brands, we need to understand what makes this brand tick or who am I going to offer this to? And obviously what kind of attributes we would like to associate it with so that it gives you a better uh, value proposition to the consumer. So obviously when we talk about it, we look into certain elements, the uh, considerations. Secondly, once you have developed, because these are the, uh, the these brand elements are like creating the brand identity. This is what the firm is going to or uh, in terms of offering to the marketplace. After that, how it is getting put into the various marketing uh, strategic programs, like for example, the communication, how is the brand promotion is done, how you are going to make it happen, how you are implementing it, uh, road shows, digital, traditional media to talk in terms of the uh, support that the brand requires in order to be noticeable, visible in the marketplace and create awareness because awareness is important. So when you are, understand another thing, critical thing is the brand elements also try to give you uh, uh, like the incredible India campaign, the, the, the Bindi, uh, that, that is a very significant part of uh, that particular brand element and that makes that campaign stand out. Uh, in terms of the incredible India campaign that we have seen. Secondly, we look into the uh, secondary associations by linking it to various other entities like the other celebrities or the some kind of, a, uh, you know, entities like your country. Uh, you brand it by that. Mostly airlines use it by the country, by the country of origin. Uh, you use mnemonics very, very strongly to utilize uh, the, the, the secondary uh, associations which it has got. Uh, at the same time, one has to also understand that all these elements should be having a very strong, uh, what I would say, in terms of strong uh, accepts, uh, aspect acceptance from the customers, not only that, but also how consistent are you uh, when you're utilizing multiple symbols, are they conveying the same message across all the culture, number one. Number two, are they able to give you uh, the kind of leverage that you are looking forward to? It depends upon how you have steadfastly uh, woven the uh, the brand, uh, while well, need the brand equity. So consistency is one of the critical factors which has been mentioned here. And I would also agree to that because uh, it should create the same kind of feeling. So for example, uh, KFC uh, in India, it comes with Kentucky Fried Chicken, it has got certain things associated with it. But when it is a, applied to India, because of certain cultural elements, you are trying to change the itineraries, you are going from a global thing to a local. So there is a certain standardization, there is also a certain amount of localization. But at the same time, the key takeaway is that the, the brand image or the brand promise does not change. Right. So obviously when you talk in terms of this is a very thing, a very important part of uh, the brand communication that what how you are com communicating about your brand elements in terms of established because if you're giving too many uh, messages, it can lead to 
confusion. It can lead to people getting confused. And when the people get confused, they will not like to associate. People like clarity, very clear minded communication, simple communication, but yet resonating with them. So that is why we talk in terms of CBE, something called the resonance dimensions, where the you could see it was it would be a self-actualization for the brand because the brand becomes very strongly connected with the consumers. But that to happen, you need to have certain guidelines, as you can see here, that you have to mix match. If you see certain brands like Starbucks, it was uh, earlier started as a cafe. It was a trading, a coffee trading house, but it went on to become a cafe. And now it is it's a cafe, which is not only dealing with coffee, but many other aspects. As I told you, it no longer talks in terms of uh, like the cafe coffee day. Of course, um, now we are talking in terms of a lot can happen over a cup of coffee. That's what that's what it says. So, so the kind of brand elements that you have can be can be mixed, matched, and can be tweaked to a certain extent, but convey the core benefit which is there uh, in terms of uh, their offering. Second is value based, um, and of course the image that you associate should be consistent, robust, and should convey. Uh, very strong uh, brand associations. Value-based pricing, channel, channel energy, obviously you blend it if you pull factor, if you have strong communications, you're able to pull the customers, you should also have channel members who can be pushing the product to the market. Uh, so obviously in that sense, your brand also registers well. It also helps in achieving the uh, results. Value-based pricing, when of course, Discounts that you give, obviously discount is something which we will not look forward in branding, but the point is if the brand is standing for certain values, then obviously consumers will accept it even without uh, going for a price cut. They will be willing to pay a premium rather than going for a price cut. So price cut is something which would not be advocating so much. Leveraging on the secondary association is one of the most important factors in terms of uh, when you are talking about creation of brands. Next, we move into what is the strong brand? What is the strong brand? A strong brand is one which engages with the customer in terms of very high image dimensions as well as the product, the way the product is unfolding. The product capabilities in terms of various product categories, you're able to, it becomes so critical that the brand is able to become an asset. You build the brand identity, you make the value proposition, you position the brand, you offer value, and the brand can be extended not only for today, for a longer period of time by the kind of communication that you are making. The brand promises are you making and what kind of a uh, imagery that you have uh, created in the minds of the, the kind of association that you have created, something which we have talked about in the CBB model and in the ACAPS model. Uh, of course, there are certain responsibility today we talk in terms of brands getting engaged in various uh, CSR activities like the PNG talks about that uh, save the, uh, the the particular uh, tiger or uh, PNG talks in terms of sorry contributing to the girl child a school for a girl child uh, or we're talking about a tiger save campaign uh, you know by one of the mobile manufacturer mobile uh, service providers. So Coca-Cola eventually got in touch with uh, NDTV in India to talk about how to encourage people to get uh, students to get sports. So this is a responsibility that the brand is extending into and we're talking about open happiness and things like that that the Coke is espousing. So the image that you are giving to the world is that, yes, you are obviously looking into products and categories, but you're also looking into the uh, the ethical, the social upliftment, also you putting a lot of efforts in terms of bringing people to the forefront, uh, encouraging and recognizing them, making it more inclusive. The more you do that, the more you invest in it, the more the brand will emerge as strong brands and engage with customers at multiple levels. And tomorrow when you look into these assortments or the brand portfolio, which have got equity as a driver, which have got very strong brands, their equity will be higher and they can live, you can leverage more, uh, what I would say, market dominance in terms of investors investing in your uh, plans, expansions of your diversifications. And obviously, uh, you know, if you have a very robust portfolio of brands, strong brands, it always lends 
are an architecture, which we call in terms of brand architecture, the robust architecture helps the company leverage more in terms of future businesses, engaging with more number of customers, the stakeholders, giving value to the to every fraternity, to every section of the society, to the government, to the stakeholders, to the consumers, but primarily the consumers. The consumers are the building blocks of your um, of, of what you want to proceed in terms of your business uh, initiative. So brands, having brand equity, having strong brands in your portfolio gives you a kind of return on investment, which companies aspire for. With these words, I would like to end today's session. Thank you for your patient listening.